The following interview was conducted with Martha Graham, class of 1935, for the Brew University Oral History Program. It took place on Tuesday, March the 3rd, 2009, at her residence in West Lafayette. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the oral history librarian. Welcome and good afternoon. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, tell us a little bit about where and when you were born and your parents. Yes, Otterman, Indiana, which had about 640 people, and the local doctor, that was what you did. We lived on the wrong side of the railroad tracks, the south east part of the railroad that ran through the Big Four. On the railroad tracks, okay? Yes. Anyhow, my dad and mother were not too young. They lived, the Otterburn Brown House is the main house in Otterburn. I mean, he had the post office and the little schoolhouse and everything to start Otterburn. A Baptist preacher, I believe, or, well, a preacher. Anyhow, my mother's father built on one side of Otterburn Brown because eventually his brother bought that house, Elmer Switzer, and my granddad Bold had come from South Carolina with his bride and took a job in Oxford and then got a chance to move to Otterburn and be a bookkeeper for the, it, it was great to take your oats and things to that railroad in Otterburn and put it in a big barn thing that, anyhow, then he became the head of the Otterburn State Bank and my father was his assistant. So it was a nice little, uh, we lived, my dad joined the Navy when I was like three years old for the First World War. We moved in with granddad and grandmother Bold because they had a big house <laughs> next to Otterman Brown. Anyhow, there were pleasant things. My mother's parents lived in North Otterburn, north of Oxford Street, which went to Chicago back in those days. Anyhow, it was pleasant. Right. Did, did I, you I have any enjoy. brothers or sisters? No. Okay. Tell us about going to grade school there and tell us a little about high school. Fine. I have my first grade picture. I'm sitting on the front steps of Otterburn, 12 years, schoolhouse, grade school, middle school, high school. And <laughs> my cousin, well, her dad bought Otterburn Brown House. Anyhow, we were best friends in grade school. And there we sit, little kids. Our school teacher, Miss Woodhams, had been teaching school for 30 years. So she took no silly stuff out of anybody. And it really toe the line. <laughs> Yeah. And you Which went there. All right. And you went there to high the same place for high school. Yes, I did. What'd you do in high school? Any clubs or tell us a little about high school? My son, my husband, and I were first. I'd be president of the class, and the next year he'd be. And <laughs> your husband to be went to the same school. So yes, he did. He moved there from Boswell, Indiana, and I think as children love or youth love, we had a kind of an eye for each other. He played basketball, and the coach in those days didn't want any dating. So we'd meet in the alley behind my house just for a, you know, it was, it was simple in those days, not like it is today. I hear but you. if you could just kiss the guy and go in and go to bed, you were tickled to pieces. That's exactly how I grew up. Right. And then um, the athletics, did you, were you, did you have gym? Did you, did you have, uh, no gym at all? They didn't have that, huh? They had girls basketball. Okay. And nothing else, huh? I wasn't, we played yeah. over the drugstore. You had to climb 20 steps to get to the gymnasium, yeah. even for all ball games. So it was not a, it was not a, Fun thing. Whatever. To right. yeah. <laughs> then, we, then, how did you decide to come to Purdue? And what year did you enter? 
1931. Okay. I graduated from high school, um, 31, and entered Purdue because the banks had closed. My granddad and my dad, my father took a job with a uh, naturally man that sold buggies and things for farmers because that kept for five dollars a week. My mother's sister lived in the country out County Farm Road in Otterburn, Tippecanoe County out on the Benton County side and she we always had a chicken in the yard and a little house so that you could move it and it had new grass, new food. So anyhow we got through it fine and since my dad had been the University of South Carolina and my mother Northwestern, he took a man's, paid him by the whatever, for Bowles and Bolt, my maiden name was Bolt, Martha Jane Bolt, to run the garage at the corner of this big Oxford Street, which became Route 52 to Chicago. and. I got to work in it. I got to haul ice one year. When I went to Purdue, if you made more than an A, they had an H then, which was a six, you got your tuition free. It was only two, I think it still is only two semesters. Anyhow, I drove back and forth because my dad had a truck to carry my mother any place she went to haul grain to that elevator down on the big four tracks. So I drove back and forth. Well, let me ask you this. What was it? Was the town, how during the Depression, were there problems within the, the town? or they... We were all the same. Okay, okay. I'm sure a millionaire out of town that had a big farm that ran itself or I don't know. Sure, but the farming was pretty good. It wasn't a problem. Right. I never knew a problem. Mm. And when you have people that take what comes to make the best of it, <laughs> I don't right. think you can beat that. Yeah. Okay, now we'll talk. Where, where's, where, when you came to campus, you took the I truck. Drove. Drove, okay. Back and and where, where was registration? Tell us about registration, how you got enrolled. Yeah, it was as simple as could be. You never wore trousers until Amelia Earhart came. And as I went along, going home to study every night, that's why I could... Oh, you didn't live on campus? Oh, no. Drove oh. back and forth, taught her. You, you drove yourself? 13 miles. Yeah. My dad trusted me. Yeah, I was mm -hmm. old enough to drive. There, were there dorm facilities on campus for uh, men and women? Um... See, I, I was... You didn't really notice it because you were back no, and forth. because I couldn't afford it. Sure, I right. never tried. But how did you come to join the sorority then? Well, it was late pledging and second semester pledging. Of your first year? Yes. And my mother at Northwestern, the Methodist, didn't believe in sororities. <laughs> she wasn't allowed to. So she said, Martha will not be a sorority woman. My father's an only child, and he said, I beg your pardon. He was a fraternity man, Pi Kappa Phi. He founded the chapter at Purdue. And she will, if she wants to, well, good people of Otter, but the druggist's daughter was an Alpha Chi Omega, and she said, I want to suggest that you be an Alpha Chi. Well, she's a lovely Davis, Burns and Davis Drugstore. And that's how it came me. about. Yeah, I've so, heard similar stories like that. The relative was in and said, "You're going to be in the same one." Which, ap after you like someone, that's happiness, sure. and no brothers or sisters. Right. So you did have a family. That's right. And I was the pledge chairman. I mean, they didn't call it president, chairman right. of the pledge right. class, which I loved. But it's the funny thing when I tell anybody now if it's mentioned that I got my tuition free the first year because of grades, they'll say, oh, how much was that? Forty dollars a semester. <laughs> I know people that came here in the 50s, in the late 40s and 50s, and there were just, there wasn't any tuition, it was just fees. 
And, you know, people hear that and they just are amazed at it. But yeah. you have to, like so many things I've shared with people, you have to put it in the context of that particular time frame. Yes, you do. Like you only made maybe a couple of dollars a week, but the costs were, you know, not the same as they are today. Exactly. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about what you majored in and then about the jobs that you had. All right. Uh -huh. The reason I chose chemistry, we did not have chemistry at Otterburn. And I thought, that's what you ought to do. Well, then I found out you had to have two years of German. <laughs> and it was nine men to one woman. So I was in classes with chemical engineers. But that's all right. It was happiness. Right. Were there many girls on campus in those days? Uh, sororities provided the girls. And it was not... I was too busy. Right. The <laughs> campus must have been a couple thousand, would you say, as an estimate to total? I would say we graduated 684. In your class? In the 35. And they didn't stay long, a lot of them. They had to go home and help with something or other and come back and add some more hours. Virginia Kelly Carnes did that. She she was in your class? Yes. Okay. But she started at Butler, and they didn't, I don't think she was an Alpha Chi there, but they didn't have any way for her to make any money as a sorority woman, so she came to Purdue, and it, it's interesting. Yes, in it is. In those days, you had to work out your own problems. Right. By right. yourself. That's right. And what what were you doing for the um, freshman engineering students? You did some cooking for the, the professors of the students? Was that what you were doing? You mean in that chemistry right. office? Yeah. Or, oh, no. you were a secretary? Yes. Okay. I made, not until I graduated, mm. but I made out the, all the tests. Mm -hmm. I graded the tests, and I kept the card, <coughs> whatever it's called, of how bright you were to get a grade in. card or what, whatever their their uh, transcript or their record. Yeah, there's an IRG or an ARM or the GREs <laughs> or whatever the yeah. S, the SATs, college entrance. Yes, yeah. and I never, I never found out my kids. They neither one chose Purdue, one chose the University of Florida. She'd been a cheerleader all of her life, and she was a cheerleader there four years. And my son was a Presbyterian, and they got to him in high school, the risks, always had any leaders that planned the Sunday service for teenagers at their house every Monday night for dinner. And they, they're Presbyterian, Central Pres. And <laughs> they had a couple come to lead singing and they were Davidson, the man was, he got my son to go to Davidson College, which is playing Purdue April the 4th, here. Anyhow, it, it's been an interesting world. Mm -hmm. All right. He uh, was bright enough to, uh, they only take A students at Davidson, did then. That was 19, yeah, 58, 54. Okay. okay. 56, whenever. Yeah. Uh, what were some of the activities that the sorority, uh, did they have think, parties in their house or uh, when you were here? No, uh, you did your own. I went over to the, um, I walked <laughs> the levee over to a boys' dormitory across from Knights of Pythias. Oh, they were on 9th Street somewhere yeah. or whatever? Uh -huh. No, far. 18th. Yes. I was going to say where Jeff is now. That's right. um, it was for young boys who need attention or assistance or guidance. Guidance. <laughs> I was going to say, don't you try this or this will happen. Sure. That's right. that's where I did. I'm on the. I was on the exponent. Good. But I did. I got the stores to give money to print it. 
So I've had a little of salesmanship, a little, which I don't think there's anything wrong with that. No, I don't think so. It pays big dividends. It gives you a little cushion there. You got it. Right. After after graduation now, then what, what came next? So it's about your career and your family. Yes. Well, n well, no. I got my job at Purdue, which paid $65. Was that the secretarial job? Or? Uh -huh. Okay. For Dr. Test and a month. And Virginia and I lived together. And it was so cold, like January the 15th of 1936, and we had, she was food. It was called, not family services like now. Home economics? Home economics. And she took care of the boys' dormitory, which was still the same as it's called now. Their food, what they got, and... And she also had a room there, but she didn't want to live there if we could live together sure. okay. and share Alpha Chi stuff. So it was just interesting. But we took a cheapest place we could find was a porch that <laughs> had been glassed in. Well, 15 below zero or uh-uh. They closed Purdue for two days and we found a warm place we could go and stay for nothing. So we were back to doing what you have to do to get along with the right. problem. Right, okay. Um, tell us a little about Virginia then. Uh, after she was your friend and then a classmate, and then you, you kept in touch. Yes, we did. She had met Bill Carnes, William George Carnes, because he came to see his aunts. He was not at Purdue? He's not at Purdue? No, oh. University of Illinois. Oh, okay. And uh, quite a scholar. I mean, a bright boy. Never had a drink in his life. So Virginia and I, when we traveled, drank his between the two of us. <laughs> <laughs> if it came free, it was his idea. We didn't drink that much. That's the funny part. Never had. Anyhow, um, I would go to see them. Did they get married after she graduated? They did. Okay. They did. And... Then they lived in Illinois or Chicago? Uh, yes. Right outside of Chicago. And the man who was head of this, as you said, Beatrice Be Foods, asked him to be the lawyer for the group. Oh, did he have a law degree? Oh, yes. Oh, he'd gone to From law school. University of Illinois. Okay. And so he worked right into president. I mean, this, he's just a bright guy. They were lucky to get him. Because as I had mentioned, I think to you, they had 349 subsidiaries, I call it, that they took care of. Wow. That's and a big operation. Had, an international convention in Europe, and I got to go along. Uh, Bill Carnes' sister is also an Alpha Chi Omega from Purdue. She and her husband went along on this too, and she's younger than I. So Virginia, Betty, Troop Vaughn's wife, and I, you know, we, I think Bill Carnes worked that into problems solved. Good. They that didn't have to worry about me. Right. He said in Europe he couldn't take care of all the luggage that you had to throw out in the next streetcar or interurban or whatever. But he did. I mean, I was right there because I think I mentioned I hauled ice for my second year paying at Purdue. My dad had this garage that he was buying Bowls and Bolt Garage, and the ice truck, I could go into Lafayette to the Ice and Coal Company and get 500 pounds, Those and blocks they'd of ice. slip it into the back of my little truck, and then I had a big thing that covered it, and there's a word for it when it keeps the like cold. Like a tarp. You tarp. <laughs> Anyhow... 
when I got back to Otterburn, all I had to do was back up to the ice house, get my board up into the back of my truck, and just slide, slide it, it in there. <laughs> and then the next thing, well, this boy that I married, this bustle boy, was running his father's filling station. And 25, a little 25 pound of ice just fit where they kept drinks. They didn't go into food like they do now when they, but being on 52, or Oxford Street, which was the same to Chicago, there was good money sure. in that little drink place. And that was fun. That's partly why I wanted to be the ice deliverer. Anyhow, I could lift 50 pounds. All of the refrigerators were out on the back porch. Nothing was ever inside. And I read the sign from the front window driving the truck. And boy, I could carry that ice back there and get it up and in that refrigerator. And I have kept that. I decided you need to keep that muscle forever. So I don't use door openers. I push them open. I still do. I just, I think the more you keep to what you were given, the better, better off you are right. going to be. Yeah. And then after, uh, did you get married then after you graduated? Well, oh. <laughs> at Purdue, working in the chemistry office, I got from Christmas through New Year's and to get back to the chemistry office, freshman chemistry office. And I rode a bus because Pete Bustle was then at Caterpillar learning to... Even Over in Peor a, Peoria? Yes. He became a district representative and had four states, North and South Carolina, Tennessee, and Georgia. Anyhow, um, yes, we're dancing. Oh, Roberta Price. Roberta, Jim Price, National Holmes, is my cousin. And my neighbor, Roberta, was an Alpha Chi at IU. That was another thing, because we I was in her group at high school, even though she's two years older than I. And <laughs> it, it's amazing how stuff all turns out. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Anyhow, we had, she had a cousin and husband living in Peoria. And Pete was already staying with him. That was the cheapest place he could go to be at Caterpillar learning the job. So he could sleep with the husband and I slept with her. So it was a, it was all legal in those days. <laughs> Anyhow, at Caterpillar, a group were having a party at the, uh, oh, the loveliest place in Peoria. You know, doesn't matter. We went down to the mezzanine where they were playing and dancing, and they were playing Red Sails in the Sunset, We Marry Tomorrow. Pete said, we're getting married tomorrow, and I said, it can't. I'll lose my job at Purdue. Well, he said, we are. And it was Sunday. Sunday. A judge or a peace guy, whatever. Well, he said, we're going to. I don't care what you say. It was first day of leap year. Anyhow, one of these folks at Caterpillar went with us to Judge Bridegroom was the man's real name. I, I have his signature. <laughs> Nobody would believe it. Anyhow, um, there was nothing. I didn't meet him as a married woman until April. Uh, there was just no sense in adding problems to more problems. So when I get home, I go to Dr. Test and tell him I've lost my job with you because I got married. And he said, I know the president better than I know most people here at Purdue. I'll just tell him we can't get along without you. So I got to stay till June. Good. But I did meet Pete in Peoria. I could drive a, a ride the bus up to this 
little wherever, whatever. So I, I got out. to know him, as the saying goes these days, or in the books you read, right, love stories. Yeah. Then what came next? So then you you stayed in Peoria, or tell us about then, your career. It's a family. Then, no, I left immediately. Okay. And we had a funny little top story of a house in, I think there was West Peoria, East Peoria, anyhow, no air conditioning. And it was as hot as could be. And you were allowed to sleep in the park. There were policemen all night. For people, there wasn't much air conditioning in 1936. So mm -hmm. it, it, it's, it's been a, a beginning downhill going uphill, <laughs> if you can make the steps. Right, make the transition. Exactly. Right. And then after Peoria, then did you, what, what did you get transferred? Or? Well, Jim Price, we had made enough money to move to Barton, Illinois. He's still working, your husband's working still for Caterpillar? Yeah. Okay. But little town suited us better than big Peoria. Sure. And we lived on a railroad track. And my dad came and got me when Sue was born. We lived there, 1938, and took me back to the doctor here in Lafayette. And of course, Jim Price and Roberta, here we are together, because he was already doing things in charge of farms and stuff until he started National Homes. Anyhow, he called Pete to tell him he was taking me to the hospital. And it took like 150 miles or something, two hours and a half. So Pete comes in the room at home hospital and says, well, where are you going? I said, I've been there and done that, so you can go look in the nursery. I just, no one knew I was pregnant. <laughs> I, I, I'm long wasted. <laughs> and they just couldn't tell the difference. So then Jerry, her brother was born, my second child was a boy, Jerry Bussell, and he was born two years and three months after Sue in Peoria. So, and the doctor in Otterburn, Dr. Cox, performed in Martin, Illinois, Otterburn, yeah. It was about the size of Otterburn. But Jim and Roberta came over and built, Jim built a national home for us. All you had to do was go down to, <laughs> to the lumber yard and get your mint. We had to get the basement built because we wanted a basement. And I had pictures taken of it and the Purdue Library, the, the new guy when he came that's still there, wife decided to write a paper on National Homes. And I told her that I had these pictures taken every two hours of a National Home going up. Your home in Illinois. In Illinois, Morton, Illinois, on Indiana Avenue, of all things. So it, it's it's been, you almost think the way was paved for you. All you had to do was find it. Right, and stay on the road. Uh-huh. Yeah. Which is kind of exciting. That's right. Then what, uh, did you live down south at all or not? In the oh, that's when Pete got, the, well, we we were sent to Michigan just for a summer. And they wanted After some, Morton and to Michigan? Uh-huh. Okay. But we, we just rented the house because it was, Peter, Caterpillar wasn't sure how long we were to be up there. Anyhow, the... They wanted a district representative for the South East, and it became Tennessee, Georgia, North and South Carolina. And we found a house in Atlanta, 27 East Lake Drive, where we could walk to church. In those days, Caterpillar didn't provide a car. You used your car. <laughs> Anyhow, you didn't get it, anything big. It was, well, we were just getting going again. Sure. 
heavy closed bags, 29, 30, 31. Right. Anyhow, it, it's, it's been that kind of a climb, excepting that Pete was killed on January 16th, 1947, with children, um, yeah, seven and nine years old. How did he die? In our car. He was, it was near Asheville, North Carolina, and those roads are okay. very windy and very up and down. It's up in the mountains and things down there. Little right. hilly right. stuff. And a guy... Was he in a car by himself? Oh, yeah. Okay. The guy, a guy hauling logs is coming down, and Pete's going up, and he admitted on the stand that he broke or put the brakes on for the front, and that whole big back end just swept, and it was only two lane, and they didn't have right. highways or whatever you call better roads back then. Hmm. So anyhow. That was very sad. Oh. Yes, excepting when you go through that with children, they don't look back. They look forward. Right. Right. We didn't sit around and cry. Right. For one thing, I got a job. Did you stay on there for a while? Or what did you do after that? I did. Okay. I did. Um, I had friends that wanted to You're buy You were still living house. in Atlanta? You were still living in Atlanta? 27 East Lake Drive. They just lived two doors away. We were friends forever. He was head of uh, Scripto, the little pens. Pen. Right. And not then. He was working toward it. We were all working toward something. But it was funny. Their house had just like a national home, but up in the air. On Heck, we had a basement and doors out of the... Well, anyhow, <laughs> it was not hard to sell the house. They bought it. Mm. That's when I rode with the furniture. I, for Pete's funeral, I had two men called me and said, we're supposed to meet Pete in the morning, and I said he was just killed this today around lunchtime. In North Carolina. Oh, we'll be right there to take you wherever, Otterman, wherever you have to go. I said, you're going to have a problem. His grandmother lived with us. My grandmother was visiting. We had a dog, two kids, and me. And they said, we have a big car. We'll make it. We made it in one day back to Otterman, Indiana. <laughs> and Roberta had arranged for the funeral. I could stay with my folks, so everything was fine. They kept the two guys that drove us up, because Jim was big enough in national homes. I mean, he could afford anything almost, or did, whether he could or not, I don't know. So, see, Network. there's another break. Right. A positive break. Right. And then what, what did you do next then? What was, tell us about after that. I Did you go back had to, to find, yes, I had to go back down, and one of Pete's was only a pledge for Kappa Sig, but one of his fraternity brothers was headed for Atlanta, so I could go back yeah. down and stay with the folks that bought my house until I could get back with my furniture. Uh, you know, as, as I say, everything just, just kind of out. whipped into place. Right. Yeah. Wonderful. So you came back to Audubon and lived there? Yes. Okay. And My kids. So your children were raised there? Yes, they were. Mm -hmm. Until I met Tom Graham, the doctor. Was he a local doctor? Yes. Oh, surgeon. Here, here in Thomas Garland Graham. Here in Lafayette? Yes. Oh. And the reason I met him, my kids are the same age as Jim Price's kids. The two girls are older, and the two boys are in the same grade of chat. The minute Friday came, Jim said, you're going to come in and stay with us on the weekend, give you a break. He's your cousin, though, isn't he? Did you yes. Say, okay. He founded 
national. Yes, I understand. And my cousin to boot, which and Roberta, we'd been to Sunday school and Methodist church, you know, we helped run it as kids. We felt like we did. Anyhow, it it was it was a wonderful arrangement. Good. So that gives you an idea. That that's right. And it well did you move did you stay live in, still stay in Ottoman or did you move to Lafayette? Well after no, you no. married him. No. Jim Price said, you're going to be head of Price and Price in Lafayette. I said, well, i got to find a car first. Oh, don't worry. Oh, I said, yes, I will. Well, gosh, a guy with Caterpillar called from Cincinnati, Ohio, and said, my wife is getting a new car. I have a red convertible I'll let you have for $3,000. My dad said, I'll lend you. Three thousand dollars. So anyhow, I rode the train. I went right to the place where the car was, where he told me to come. So I had a car. Okay. So then, so then you worked for uh, Price and Price. Okay. Across from the courthouse, it was right across north from the courthouse. And it was wonderful because I could walk over to Main Street. There was a Walgreens there with a lunch counter. You know, I've heard you, people say that. Yeah. You don't always <laughs> get that these days, no. the lunch counter. Mm -mm. And that lasted until... But you were married to Dr. Graham by then. Well, oh. when we were there from Friday until Sunday afternoon, I... I could be in the back seat with Tom Graham on Saturday night because he was a bachelor. And there was another woman that had always been back there with him. I don't even know her name. She was a school teacher. Anyhow, I finally said, oh, Jim Price was having our upstairs made into an apartment. We needed a bathroom up there. We needed a kitchen. This is in your home in Otterburn. Otterburn. Okay. My folks... And my dad built a bungalow because my mother's cousin married my dad's cousin over in, we don't care where it was, Whatever. someplace right. east of Lafayette. And there's room for another apartment up there, which isn't always true. So I said, Jim, we're not coming because it's finished now. And it was going to be June the 16th, which is David Price's birthday. And he wanted to take, he was very fond of his son. And it doesn't matter what year it was, I could figure it out if I had to. Anyhow, they wanted to go to a hotel in Chicago where there was ice skating and a, almost a children's story. I mean, that kind of an afternoon entertainment, which would be a nice birthday mm -hmm. with Anne, not just boys, girls also. Oh. So that worked out very well. Then I wondered, would Tom Graham, you know, ask me to go out with them up in, uh -huh, we weren't going to be riding anywhere in that, I wouldn't be in that back seat anymore. And he did. So I just said, you come on out here. We'll, I'll cook, because I have a kitchen now. And these two kids, my folks, worked right in. My mother ran Town Hardware in Otterburn, and my dad did all of the bottled gas for all of, well, my mother would say he took care of all the widows. <laughs> if they had something free, he could do free for them. <laughs> So we, we've been volunteers. <laughs> That's a good way to go, I think. You know? I think it is. Right, yeah. Th then um, what, uh, your, and he passed away then? And then did you stay on? Tell us what, uh, when, when your children Tom were, Graham. Oh. Well, we were, he, he, got married. he asked me to marry him. Mm -hmm. And they, National Homes, let's see, we were married. He bought the house at 1213 Weeog, and we were in it 
Sue and Jerry didn't want to, they hated Jefferson High School. Otterburn High School didn't like big schools. They were naughty. So they waited uh, from November until January, two months, and then they gave in. So anyhow, we went to, um, oh shoot, New Orleans for honeymoon and it didn't take long driving in those days when you're in love doesn't take long to do much of anything anyhow we get back home and as I say then the kids came eventually to live at 1213 which it took some time to get extra furniture together to live across from the Lafayette Country Club which was wonderful because Tom put our name in to join immediately and we the kids could step right over there and start playing golf. So And swimming. It was exciting. Yeah. Really. Right. Yeah. Then our next problem, um they flew the National Homes Group always the guys went someplace and this was up in Canada where the National Home plane took them, but they had to stop at the border line with Canada, or yeah, Canada, because there was only a lake you could land on, Barney's Ball Lake Lodge. And when they came back from that trip, they got back in their own plane, and it was said, this is October 7th, 1951, they said they didn't change the altimeter to Lafayette from Canada or the borderline. I don't know what caused it, but anyhow, it crashed out near Pine Village. Or, yes, must have been southwest of Lafayette. So Roberta and Eleanor Price, the two Price wives and I, were together. George Price and Jim were the two National Homes guys. Anyhow, oh, Eleanor Price said, we're driving out there. And I said, no, we're not. They need that for the ambulance. They need it for fire trucks. They need it for two lane road, little road out in yeah. the country. So anyhow, Tom was killed. He. When they he got was on, on the plane with Jim Price? He was on the plane with Price? Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. See, he was their doctor. Okay. That's how we got together. He was, yeah, for the National Homes. But any, <laughs> anyhow, it's, it, it all just, when it unfolds, it's unbelievable somehow. Anyhow, Jim said, you'll never believe George always rode up with the pilot, the brother, Price. And Tom, we had our own airplane here that he had just sold to a boy that I taught in high school in Wharton, <laughs> Illinois. A doctor. He had become a doctor and wanted to fly mm -hmm. to his whatever mm -hmm. constituents. Anyhow, um, gosh whiz. Yeah. Jim, yeah, Jim's telling me about Tom. He says to George, why are you sitting up with the pilot? What George said I always do. Tom said, do you have your pilot's license? No. Well, do you have your commercial license? Tom had both. Because we had had this plane, or we got to ride in it for breakfast, Tom would take, the minute he got through with people at the hospital, we went out someplace on Sunday morning, which was fun. Anyhow, um, that that's, that's how he got killed with the pilot and one other guy. And one man walked away with the gift for his wife that at a shop up in Canada you know, there's always a shop to bring something right. home to somebody. 
Anyhow, that's how I lost Tom Graham October 7, 1951, hmm. coming home from the, from the what trip up there. Yeah. What was next then? Did you continue living there? And tell us a little about what happened after that. Yes. Okay. I stayed at 1213 We All, and Sue and Jerry still had high school. They walked to school, that was no problem, from down to Jefferson High School. And my next, huh, I didn't do much entertaining because I was never sure until insurance took over what, what would happen next. But the minute I was given what I could afford to buy a cottage up on Lake Freeman, that's what I did. Okay. I had already started being a chapter advisor at Purdue, Alpha Chi Omega, and that was interesting because next I became province president. I was assigned it, I didn't ask for it. And I was that one year and they said, we'd like for you to be a national collegiate vice president. And it was all, you pay for everything. You don't get paid to do it in a sorority, or you didn't in those days. And I said, got to do it. Got to go up the ladder when the time comes. Right. <laughs> so that I did that for seven years okay. and loved every minute of it. So that was... Another bunch of steps right. to rise up. Let's talk a little bit about the um, li the scholars program, the library scholars at the class of 1935. Okay. <clears throat> How that came about. All right. <clears throat> when we had, I was elected corresponding secretary before we graduated from Purdue, my class. I was on the final, it was always three men and one woman gala week to find out who was going to keep the glass class going after you graduated, you had a president, vice president, and treasurer, and the secretary was always the <laughs> woman. So there must have been three men to one woman, even then, in 1935. <laughs> Anyhow, um, here I am, back being able to gather people together when they needed it, and I don't remember writing anybody for five years, but we had a 10th mm -hmm. together, the, called the class together, and when we got to our 50th, here's Virginia Kelly Carnes again. She was on a trip with Bill, her husband, water by boat, and one of the guys in our class who had learned to line oil pipe, he was from Texas, in the oil business, so that when there was no oil going through it would not rust, having, you know, getting drier. <coughs> and he gave the library $100,000 they were on the ship, he and his wife with Jim. Was this uh, the 100000 the class gift for the class? No, just he to, gave oh. it for the class of 35 because he learned to do it in the Purdue Library when we were all going to school. Anyhow, he's still alive, by the way, in Virginia, isn't he? But anyhow, Virginia and Bill always had the best on the boat up on top. They didn't know where he was. They just saw him at the captain's table most of the nights, never with a wife. So Virginia said, if I ever have any more than $100,000, I'm going to give it to the Purdue Library from the class of 35 to beat that guy that gave the 100000 <laughs> So Bill dies, and I was, they always had That's her husband. Down. Bill Carnes. Bill Carnes. 
they always had me come down there because I was movable and one person and I had taken my kids to their house when they lived in Chicago. It was an ongoing association. <laughs> Anyhow, <coughs> it was the darndest thing. Here we are. I'm trying to, Baring was the president of Purdue. And because of Virginia Carnes being the first chairman, woman chairman of the President's Council, President's Council, they would go see her because by then they have moved from their fancy house in California, left Chicago, had their lawyer still in Chicago, and had gone to well, marble halls and marble walls outside of San Diego. It was a millionaire's, well, retirement village. Right, right. And, of course, I visited there, too. Anyhow, was Bill, Bill, is Bill was dead by then? Her husband had died by then? He died there. Oh, okay. He had gout, which I have now. I'm He'd retired from the company? He did, too. He'd retired and they moved out there? Oh, yeah. Okay. Oh, Yes, he had gone through all of his time that he had plus CEO. And the guy who took over, took over Beatrice Foods, he was with, um, oh, when you sell cows and stuff in Chicago. He was on the board, but he just, there is no Beatrice Foods anymore. He hmm. could not handle it, and Bill Carnes was out of it. He'd served every min minute that he could. Anyhow, first Bill lost uh, up to a knee, and then he lost the other one up to a knee. Well, anyhow, he was he he died, and uh, oh, I was telling you about I, I when. The Beerings quit going there because they would bring her fancy plants from Hawaii and always something lovely because she did her share to Purdue libraries. Anyhow, I get a call from Judy Shoemaker and she says, what about Virginia Carnes now that the Beerings aren't? And I said, you've got to go. Because she looks forward to seeing somebody from Purdue and your library, because I'd been working with her. Anyhow, <laughs> it worked, because when Virginia went comatose, she's two years older than I am, they called Judy Shoemaker to say, Purdue is in the final estate, whatever they make out, the will. Oh, I think okay. it's called a will at that point. And we think you should come out here to hear the the Chicago Realtor or whatever wants you out here. Yeah, he's just a plain old lawyer, isn't he, at that mm -hmm. point? Yeah. I don't know. Whoever right. handled... Handled the estate. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Anyhow, Judy said, there I'm sitting, and she can't... This lawyer says to her, Virginia, we know that you can't speak, but you can hear me? Yes. She nodded her head. This is what Judy told me. And he said, I have your hand on my wrist and when it's yes you squeeze and when it's no just take your hand away and Judy Shoemaker said boy when they got to and I shall give Purdue University one million dollars she said I held my breath <laughs> and then you could see that she squeezed it was still a yes hmm. so that's how it came about. But how did well that? But the library scholars thing was something that your class—that was a separate class gift, was it not? Well, oh. that's 
We was that have the 50th? already been doing that okay. here. Was that started part of your 50th anniversary gift, or did it start before See, that? See, I was in Georgia 27 years. Okay. So I don't know. It was already in, in place. What Whoever did it, okay. did it it's without... Been going. I, I wasn't in on it. Okay. So it was, I, not, it was not the class... Class gift for the fiftieth, not okay. No, okay. Well, yeah. Oh, we all got together for the fiftieth, back here. Sure, okay. But uh, no, not after that, because I didn't. Well, I moved here, as you know, in ninety two, but I was on Dogwood Farm until eighty seven. Then I moved into a, a little town to figure out what to do next. Then they said you're supposed to die in Arizona, so. I had a traveling secretary when I was an Alpha Chi vice president of collegiates, and she had a, a motel in Parker, Arizona, right on the border with California. I could look, I could go out, motel. And I thought, my gosh, she was my first traveling, she and another girl were my first two traveling secretaries. Anyhow, I knew that her husband had died, a banker, and I knew that her son had moved in with her. Anyhow, I moved out there. I rented two apartments in her motel. I did all the cooking, and she had a woman who worked in the office. There was a pool there I could walk across and take a swim any time I wanted to. Anyhow, I found out before a year was up that she was an alcoholic. When I went, she had an apartment or a little building next door for travel agency, which was smart, motel. Right. And I heard her curse her best friend working there, and I'm in there typing for her. And I just went back over and I said, why were you cursing your best friend? Well, she said, she didn't water that plant by the door. I said, wait a minute. You don't curse somebody for a plant. Oh, yes, you do. <laughs> Hung over. I didn't say much then. I went back to my apartment and a few mornings later, the girls that would come in and clean the apartments, getting ready for the new batch to come in. Housekeeping. One of them came over crying, and she said, she cursed me this morning. I said, honey, you're privileged. She curses her best friends. I didn't know what else to say. Then I went over and I said, I want to hear about you cursing the people that work for you. Well, they're not doing it right. I said, you know what? I'm going to move. I'm going back to Indiana. You can't do that. You'll leave me with two apartments empty. I said, I have paid you well. I'm not worried one bit about it. Hmm. I had called Sue, told her, and with her, she has her bachelor's degree in nursing. She has a break. She said, I'll come and get you. You get the company to come move you, and we'll take, I had the blazer, which I just gave her last year. Anyhow. That's how it came about. That's how you find yeah. out where you don't need to be. Right. Now that you're, uh, tell us a couple of your activities that you're in uh, Westminster. You do some of the, talk oh. about the flea market, things that you mm. do. I got asked to do mail. <laughs> And I said to you this sort the mail? 93. Not even a year. And she ran the front office. We had our mailboxes up on the first floor where, where you came in. And I said, how do you know I can do mail? Well, we were both Central Presbyterian <laughs> and my kids had gone through the ropes. She said, I know it. Don't worry about it. So I started mail then, still do it. And I told you about asking Sandy Daniel about how do I find out new people here, and she said, start a newspaper. 
Been doing it ever since. Right. And I had worked for the bank in Decatur, Georgia. That was when I lived on Dogwood Farm. That was the bank I used. And if they had no one, no person alive, they had a woman because the bank was in charge of the house. And she was a friend of mine. She took over flea marketing the house and its interior stuff. That was fun because I could choose, I could take jewelry one time, I could take different things and get ideas about flea marketing. So that's why when I got asked to help with flea market here, sure. I'm home free, right? <laughs> right. So this is how I've arrived where we are today. Good. I quit because they had no air conditioning and it would get up to 86 in that room. And in winter, they had no way, one little room, which they now have enlarged. And it would be down, well, cold. They finally found a little heater. And if you put your hand three inches above a log job on the floor, you might feel a little warmth, but it was not comfortable. Right. Yeah. Um, do you have a favorite Purdue tradition that comes to mind? Any tradition that you think about? Hmm. Mortarboard, I made it. Good, good. Um, and that's a long, long-serving organization. Still goes. Oh, it was, it was fun. Right, right. We and got they, to meet Amelia Earhart just because we threw a party for her when she was there teaching some, you know. Sure. Uh, we had dances with fraternities. It was a pleasant time. Right, right. I enjoyed. I enjoyed every minute of it. Right. I know. I can tell. And do you have an outstanding event in your life that you'd like to share with us? Funerals. I don't think are that kind of outstanding. It's what comes to mind. Yes. <laughs> Sometimes they can be mon monumental. Well, that's the well, Lafayette Country Club. And then after I married Tom Graham, because we quit the country club, of course, uh, he was an elk, and they take women in free at the elks. So <laughs> that, that solved a weekend if you needed to take someone out to eat. Sally Watlington got in on some of that, because sure. they had good food out there, but not anymore. Um, I'm trying to think since then. No, I think here took over. Good. <laughs> that sounds good. Any closing, any special things that you'd like to say in closing? Just that I was raised well, and I think my youngsters are proving that they must have been raised pretty well because they're both doing well. <laughs> That's what you have to hope for. We still see each other. I had three reunions, because I'm the root now of my ancestry. Right here I had the first one, out near our time. There was a funny little cute place I could, it was, uh, it, they all ran $5,000 each, but it's worth it to get your whole family together. I paid for everything the minute they got here. They had to come onto this soil, and then I Took care, care of them. Yeah, good. And we had one down in San Antonio. My son took care of getting it arranged on an island, which was wonderful. Then I paid that little bit. And the third one, University Inn. Yeah, those are my three. Good. We just had another reunion in North Carolina. My daughter took care of it. One of the men that graduated with her in the University of Florida called her to say that he had bought, um, well, it was an Indian name of a, I don't know how many acres, six or 10 or 15, and you bring your own food to it, 
in the main house was it was man had buried an Indian and they thought it was high up in the mountains in North Carolina. They thought they would get lots of people coming there to see the park and the cool air and lots of trees. It was wonderful. I didn't have that to pay for because everybody brought food. They brought their own food. Every family brought its own food for its kids. Sort of different. Yeah, that's right. Tell us something about celebrating your 95th. What did you do for your 95th? Nothing. Nothing, okay. Never have. Okay. I've never had birthday parties. One week from Christmas, it doesn't work. Yeah. They've all got families, and I want them, I want them to take care of their families. <laughs> we have it at another time. <laughs> right. Yeah, that's right. Okay. Thank you very much, Martha. I've really enjoyed this. It's been wonderful. Thank you. You're good <laughs> at it. Thank you.